Hello and welcome to How to Diorama with Scale Modelcraft. I am Bill, and um, today we're gonna look at um, you know we're just gonna look at the progress that I made uh, this week on the World War One trench diorama. Um, you know, last week we talked about lighting and stuff like that because I was kind of getting more into it. Oh, hey, Martin is here. Hello, Martin. I, I want to put that up there. Hello. Hello, boys and girls. Cheers from Holland. Hello, Martin. Thanks very much. I saw your plane and you got a new, um, you got a new backdrop. That sounds really cool, Martin. I, I saw that one picture, but I haven't seen too much of it. I was kind of prepping, but uh, very cool. Thanks very much for coming in. So this last week I did a lot of painting and, and it was really about filling the, the, the different rooms, the different rooms that I've created in this diorama. So here's the diorama right here. Let me, let me go ahead and say, uh, hi, John is here. Hello. Thank you very much for coming in, John. I really appreciate that. And Martin, thanks. Yeah, that was really cool looking. Um, you know, getting a backdrop and we should probably talk about that part of this is going to be angle and view angle and looking in the diorama, but getting a backdrop to take pictures of your stuff is really great. If you haven't done that yet, or if you've just been kind of cobbling something together, um, getting a backdrop to take pictures of your models and your dioramas and the things that you create is, is really great idea. One of the things that I've wanted to do is incorporate one literally right here on the, um, on the workbench. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do is I just want to get a blind, like a, a window blind, and, and then just put it up there. And when I want, I just pull it down. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. I've kind of got that set up in there with an old uh, movie projector, but it's, it's a great thing for like a backdrop for taking pictures. Um, Scott is here. Hello, Scott. Afternoon, Bill and the rest of Fantastic Modelers. Thank you very much for coming in, Scott. Scott said hi earlier too, you know, before the, the stream started. Uh, so that's very, very cool. Martin, I just got a small booth. It's small, but fun to play with. And, and I got to tell you, when, when you start taking pictures of your stuff, um, and, and we're going to look at some pictures that I took this week, and, and there's an issue, and it's lighting. And, and I thought I had it, like, all, you know, figured out. Don't. So I'm trying to figure that out still. But it's, it's really cool. Hey, there's Paul. Hello, Paul. Thanks very much for coming in. So why don't we uh, dive in? Paul was here actually earlier. You know, he kind of comes on uh, uh, early on when I, like, first load up the thing that says it's coming on. So that's really cool. So I'm going to go and swap over to pictures here. And um, I want to show you what I worked on. Um, so what I've been doing at the beginning of my live streams is I, I kind of want to ground this. And so I just show you the whole thing. So that's what this is. So this is like the front of the diorama. It's a three uh, story diorama. Uh, three level, I guess, diorama. And so there's the front of it and all of these levels need to be worked on. Um, this is the left side and, and there you go. So that's kind of like the, the, the little grounding I like to do. Um, this is the Livens um, uh, large gallery flame projector, you know, in the, in, and you've seen this before, but I started painting it. So I just did some, um, some gray primer. I, I just use Tamiya. I like Tamiya. Um, same thing for this. You know, we talked about building this last week while I, I started getting it in primer and stuff like that. This is the fuel cell for the flame projector. Now, for the uninitiated or, or, or for folks that maybe don't know, the Livens Large Gallery Flame Projector was a massive 56 foot long flamethrower from World War I that was deployed against the Germans. It was invented by um, Captain William H. Livens, uh, a British officer, and it was deployed against the Germans in World War I in 1916. Um, as a matter of fact, right about the time, well, I don't know exactly the month, but I know, I, I just heard earlier this week that, you know, tanks were introduced in 1916. So, you know, big, big technology coming around at that point. So, anyway, um, the Livens gun, this is the fuel cell for that, that flame projector. Uh, these are some other components. Again, just kind of, you know, shot them with the, with the primer. And then uh, once I got everything shot with primer, I started, you know, doing detail stuff. And, and this is where I started. Um, real quickly, I just want to say hi to a couple of folks that came in. Um, Steven came in. Fantastic. Hello, Steven. 
Um, Stephen Robbins is the gentleman who gave me the uh, MAK, MAK <laughs> raccoon. Uh, remember my last diorama, Emma, Carlos, and Ichiro, which I actually, I, I released a, a video on Tuesday. And, and I hope you got a chance to see it possibly. Um, but that kit and that whole thing came from uh, Stephen giving me that kit. And it was just wonderful. So thank you again, Stephen. I, I really enjoyed all the MAK stuff. Uh, and, and I'm going to be getting back to that too. Um, uh, Martin says, looks impressive as is already Bill. Well, thanks very much. I think it's kind of cool. All the technical stuff. I think, you know, what Martin's talking about was the, was the, um, uh, let's get back there real quick. He was talking about, I believe that. So anyway, uh, and then Steven says, uh, when are we going to get, see that camel? Hey, that's a really good deal. Uh, I also have a camel from Steven. And um, I'm actually looking forward to doing that. That camel is cool. And I think it's going to be in the same universe as Emma, Carlos, and Ichiro. So uh, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And I have some different ideas for it. I, I don't know if it's going to be wrecked, but I think there's going to be kind of a battle thing going on. I don't know. We'll see when I get there. Okay, so let's get back to these slides real quick. Uh, but thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so I, I dug in to painting and the first thing was this. And so this is just a toothpick. And I just took a shot of it because what I needed to do on these books, and these are books that were previously just little pieces of plastic, and then I painted them. And then I needed some binder detail on them. So what I did was I just took that little, that little um, toothpick, sharpened it down to like a wedge, and I would dip that in paint and just get little lines right on those, uh, right on those books. And I think they look great in the shelves. I, it, me personally, I think they, I hope you do. I love it. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, oh, and then Steven had another comment and he says, love the world of one stuff too. Excellent. Well, thank you, Steven. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm really glad you're on. I haven't seen you for a little bit, so it'd be really fun, uh, to, to catch up. Um, so after I got those done, uh, I moved to this little table. So now that had some books on it too. And I think I've shown the little table before, but what this is, is this is Captain Livens. Um, it's his study. So upstairs in this, we have, this is Captain Livens study. So I've got a couple of rooms that I've been working on primarily this week. And this is one of them. And also where the, um, where the uh, Livens uh, flame projector is going to go. But that one um, has two stories. You know, it's an underground facility, but it has two stories in that particular room. So it's going to be kind of cool, I think. Uh, and let's see, Martin says, I'm kind of going back and back and forth between two screens and that's what's messing me up. Martin says nifty. Well, thank you, Martin. That's cool. Um, so yeah, I really like this. Uh, I really like this uh, little desk. Uh, the little skull is just something that I like to do, but this is supposed to be um, Captain Livens kind of upstairs study in his lab. And um, I did some things that were very specific to show that that was like his personal area. Um, and then Martin says, that's funny. Uh, Martin says, who is the unfortunate paperweight? Um, he was 3D printed. So I think we're all safe. We're not going to get tagged by this guy. Um, so I started doing oils. Now, here's the thing. Oils are all fine and well, and they, I mean, I've used them for a while, okay? I've used oils for a little bit, and I've gotten familiar with them, but only like for like one part of weathering. And, and this time I said, you know what? I want to kind of do all my weathering with oils. I, I did, but it didn't come out the way I wanted. I think the thing for me personally that I'm getting used to with using oils to do weathering and the like is I need to think about getting everything painted in all the colors that I want. And this is what I didn't understand. And once I've got all those colors painted, the colors I want, then weather. I was thinking I could come in with these oils and I could, I could do some color changes, not modulations and not filters and, you know, none of that stuff. I was talking about full on color changes and 
it, it didn't work all that great with me. So, I mean, I got there, but it took an awful long time. So I just went back and forth, you know, again and again with this kind of stuff. And, and it worked pretty good. These don't look all that great. But I think later on, it started to really come out. Now, here's where I shifted and went back to Tamiya and, and, and got some highlights. Because this is one of the things I want to talk about today. And, and, and it's going to become a little bit more apparent. Here's a little bit better view, I think. And, and I think it's coming out a little bit better at this point, too. But when I'm... When I'm painting a miniature, it's maybe counterintuitive. When I see really, really great painters in my modeling clubs and online and stuff, they paint it like a picture. In other words, it's it's just beautiful. It's incredibly rendered. It's it's you know every little detail on there, and and, and you're so impressed. It looks real, right? That's that's kind of the impression I get. When I'm painting a miniature. Because of how I have it displayed, you know, I'm going to be displaying these things inside of this diorama. And because they're placed inside of something that has shadow, and I'll light it so it doesn't have as much shadow, but still, there's going to be shadow. I really want to kind of over highlight the highlights and over, I guess, shade the shading parts. And, and, and the, the reason is this. Um, I think we've heard of Kabuki, right? It, it's it's the old, it's the Japanese, boy, I'm going to slaughter this. This is really wrong. From what I understand, Kabuki is is it's the makeup and the type of play and, and the type of presenting a story in ancient Japan. Please don't slaughter me on that one. I'm I'm just guessing here. It's my interpretation of it. And so when they do that, they overemphasize uh, the makeup and they overemphasize um, the facial expressions and they overemphasize their reactions. You know, everything's big and stuff like that. Well, it, 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 it kind of has to be. And, and the reason is they're trying to get strong emotions across and they, they're playing to a crowd of people and stuff like that. So they're trying to get that out to everybody. Well, I'm thinking in the same way when I am painting the little articles that are going to be inside of my diorama, I want to draw, well, I've talked about this a lot. I want to draw your eye in. And so by drawing your eye in, I need things to hook your eye. And, and so the, you'll see in the middle of these fuel tanks on top here, there's these big white stripes coming down. Well, they really contrast when they're in the diorama. And, and that's what I want. I want high contrast. I want big changes. You know, this, this goes to this. So everything dark is a little bit darker. Everything light is a little bit lighter because I'm going to have these things in low light. Even though I'm, I'm lighting this, I'm going to light everything. Everything is going to be in a little bit lower light. And, and, and it's really important at that point to make sure that, I have those contrasts in and I add those contrasts as I'm painting almost at every level. I don't want to do the whole thing and then put it in the situation and then come back and say, oh, I got to do more. I kind of go overboard because I've done it a few times now and I know what I'm looking for. OK, uh, I got a couple of questions here. Uh, why did you want to? I'm sorry. Why did you want to do only oils? I just to learn a little bit better. Um, I've, I've got a friend, Eric, and he's sometimes on here and um, he's really great with oils. And he basically did his base paint job on this little FJ that he did. And it came out great. And he did all of his weathering with oil. And then, then there was other stuff. There was like graphites and this and that. But I'm just trying to expand my, my understanding of painting with oils and, and, and doing that. So I just kind of... I. I, I went a little bit too far into it at first. I, I think that, uh, you know, getting my base colors down, all the detail, and then going out with the oils just for weathering is, is what I should do. I was trying to do it from base coat forward, all oil. And for me, it didn't work that great. I mean, it came out okay. You know, I mean, it doesn't look bad. Uh, this is exactly what I wanted to look like. So that's fine. Just took me an awfully long time to get there. Um, I think overemphasizing works, especially in dark environments. So I think that fits well in the underground stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly the reason, Martin. It's, it's because it will be in uh, 
a lower light. Even though it's being lit, it's still, I'm casting shadows and stuff like that. So I want stuff to pop out. I want you to see it. And it's on angles, you know, and things like that. So you'll see as we go forward here, that's kind of how I, I've done my painting. Um, here's the Livens gun. Now, the other thing that I did was on the actual uh, Livens Large Gallery flame projector, um, as this thing would pressurize, it would raise up and it would go through the soil. And by going through the soil, then the head would be up above the, the, the terrain and then it would shoot flame toward the German lines. Well, in doing so, the controls to, to, to make it start and stop, go up and down, were handled by these two ropes. So this rope in the back right here on the back side of it, um, that rope is what uh, I believe that fires it. This front rope, that will raise it. I'm just guessing. You know, I don't have but some pictures of this, some actual pictures and stuff like that, and, and even some action pictures of it shooting, but I couldn't really exactly tell. But it looks very, very convincing in the way that it's presented. So I, I believe that's how that goes. So those two ropes had to be on there. I was happy to get those on. Um, and then you'll notice that there's a, a, a hose now coming to the back of it. So I've got the supply line between uh, the Livens gun and the, the fuel projector fuel cell. So the next thing, um, and, and I guess I should say this too, all this week when I, when I paint, you know, it's paint and dry, paint and dry, paint and dry. And oils do take a little bit longer. So I started going into, you know, many other areas that need some attention in the diorama. And so I started working on that too. What we have here is the, this is Captain Livin's office upside down. You know, when I was building this, I never did uh, put a bottom on it. I thought I would need access. I thought I would need to get in through the bottom. So I just held off. So this week I said, you know what? I got to button this thing up because I'm starting to glue things in and I didn't have a floor to glue things to. So I just put that floor in and then I started working on this. So now this one is a biggie. This is Captain Livin's, um, his bunk. You know, he's in here. Okay. And if you look uh, back in there, this is really terrible for me to do this, but you see on top of the, the shelves there, those are the books. That's the bookshelf in there. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but to the left, right? I don't know. Um, in that corner, that's where the head of the bunk is going to be. So when we look at this little bunk, you know, you can see it here. Um, I use Kim wipes. Uh, and toilet paper to, to, you know, put the bunk together, the blankets and the, and the mattress. I made a little mattress and stuff like that. And then here's that real bright highlighting, you know, so this is oils. I, I painted the, the top blanket gray, and then I just took white and started hitting all the highlights and it really brought it out. And that's the kind of stuff that, that I really wanted to get across that right there. Um, is going to be seen in low light quite nicely. It'll still give shadows. It'll still show you what it is, but I wanted an unmade bed to show that Captain Livens was, you know, look, this is during wartime. He's developing it during the war. It wasn't a pre-war invention. It was during wartime. And so my idea is that Captain Livens, in the development of this weapon, um, was like constantly developing it. The, the bed is disheveled. You know, he's an officer. It should make his bed, you know, maybe. But he was just always working. And, and so that's, it's just kind of something to lend to the story a little bit too. Okay. So uh, I made the bed uh, and, and I'm really happy with how it came out. Here's that um, delivery hose. So I, I built a delivery hose uh, out of lead wire and um, shrink tube. So this, I have an example here somewhere. You know, I do this every time. I have things I want to show you, and then I can't find them. Um, give me just a second. So what I did was I took, and Oscar is just going bonkers. Folks, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to bring Oscar. In. I really shouldn't leave the screen, I understand, while I'm talking. But, you know, Oscar is just going bananas, wants to go outside, and can't. So anyway, back to this. 
what this is, is lead wire. And then I just took some shrink tube and, you know, for electrical work, the smallest that I had, put around the lead wire and then shrunk it. Um, I wanted to have like some connectors. I didn't have pieces of shrink tube to do the whole length. And so what I did was see these little connectors in here. What those allow me to do is just take sections of the shrink tube and butt up against that. And it looks like a connector. They got to do a little bit of paint. And then the last thing I did is I put just a little bit of a light white wash on it. And it looks really great. I mean, maybe not here, but it does look really great inside. It looks like a, like an old tube. Um, and so the other thing that's really nice about that is when I want to bend this because there's lead wire in it, there you go. Um, much better than copper. Copper with insulation, you know, copper electrical wire with insulation, it will bend, but it'll spring back, you know, so you bend it there and then it'll spring back. And then you bend a little bit further and it'll spring back to there, you know, so it's kind of a pain. This lead, even though it's inside this, um, this shrink tubing, does really nice in holding, I'm trying to do this over my shirt so you can see, it does really nice in holding its shape. So some of that lead wire, and again, I get my lead wire online and the kind of lead wire, it's for fly fishing. So fly fishermen, fire, fly fisher people, is that the way I should say it? Um, I do want to be properly pronouncing it. Um, came in a pack like this. There were six of them, three different sizes, two of each. And they were great. I love them. Um, it was not very expensive for this. Uh, I got this actually for working on a project for Stephen Robbins, who was on the call earlier. I think he's maybe still here. I'm not sure. But yeah, so that lead wire is great stuff. All kinds of uses for it. And I think it really enhanced and helped here because I needed a heavier hose or tube that delivers the fuel to the gun. So that is that. Uh, what do we got next here? Um, connecting. See, here's the thing is I'm thinking I've got this all nailed down. It's just time to paint. Well, no, there was this that I needed to build. And so I built this little thing and it's, it's kind of like some of the other stuff. It's a nondescript thing. I think it regulates the O2 pressure going into the fuel cell. And so I built this little guy. I put a little Mr. Surfacer on it, painted her up. Boom. There you go. The angle is specific. Now I, I, I have to do a little sanding on on the the fuel cell because it's supposed to be at an angle like this little piece is here so it's down at one side so they when they built this uh in, in the original it's actually the same thing i've got a, a picture of it here and it's going to come out i've got a picture later to show you but this whole thing you'll notice that here it's higher than over here everything has got this little bit of a just a few degree slant um and I guess that was to get the fuel out easier. I'm not sure. Um, but that slant, that angle is supposed to be there. Um, and so it's maybe a little bit more apparent here. But uh, got a little bit of weathering on that. I'm pretty happy with it. Again, these things are underground. So you would think maybe in a test lab or something, there wouldn't be so much corrosion. There wouldn't be so much kind of, you know, rust and stuff like that. Well, I beg to differ. Uh, this thing is underground. It's 30 feet underground. Um they're moving the stuff through a tunnel. There's a lot of moisture. You know, my tunnels look pretty nice right now. You know, they're kind of pristine and, and like, here's one tunnel section. It's all nice and pretty. Ain't going to be that way. I've got to do like Mr. Neil Bullard. Um, I'm going to put a bunch of mud. I'm going to damage these walls a little bit. I'm going to damage the floors. Um, there's going to be a lot of dirt. There's going to be a lot of stuff underneath. It's going to look wet. It's going to look horrible because it was a horrible thing that they were doing underneath there. I'm, well, I'm not going to say what they were doing was horrible. The, the circumstances in which they were working were horrible. And so that's what I want to go ahead and bring out. Okay. So let's look at this. Uh, then I started working on this guy, which is really fun. So these are the little trucks. I, I had ordered these a long time ago and I, and I showed them a couple times, but I hadn't had the, the chance to do much with them this week I did. So I built a little wooden deck on it. Uh, I put a little bit of styrene on it. I had some chain um, and I made it into this little guy. Um, and I think it came out great. 
But then when I put it back on the track, I'm like, oh no, I got to paint that track. So <laughs> I came back and started working on the track. Now, this track is nowhere near done. But what I did was I started out with using um, um, like a, a, a rust wash, like a, an acrylic rust wash to get it wet. And then I brought in pigments because I wanted that grittiness. You know, they've got the these pigments and they're fantastic. Um, these are Vallejo pigments that I like to use. There's other folks out there. And it's just the dry powder uh, in different colors. This one is heavy rust or dark rust or old rust, I think it is. This one is burnt umber. Yes, yeah, I don't even know what I'm talking about. But it works great because what I did was I put that on first to get it wet. I used that kind of like the, the medium, the carrier or whatever. And then I made up a little bit of a paste. And this little paste was this real gritty, looks very, very rusty. So now the, the ties, the railroad ties, they won't stay rusty. Those are going to go dirt, blackish, you know, like railroad ties. But um, the tracks are now going to have the nice rust on them. The nails are going to have the nice rust on them. The, the turntable has all that. And uh, like I said, I have to go back and, and finish painting those, but it was a good start. Um, so I was pretty happy about that. The next thing, or maybe even the last thing, was this. So this is the backstop. So in in the in I've got it right here. In this, I've got the Livens large gallery flame projector right there. That's the the fuel cell that we were looking at. And as we go around here, we can see there's the the Livens um, gun. Okay, that's the flame projector itself. And then right there under my finger, that is the backstop. So this whole thing started out with, I wanted a 007 kind of Q lab. Remember when Q had the lab and, and 007 would get his mission from M and then he would have to go and see Q and he would get like some special equipment. Sometimes it happened in the field. Sometimes it happened at, you know, MI6. Um, well, that kind of, of uh, testing lab, to me, says, you know, uh, British Special Services or, or, or police or whatever, you know. Um, and I thought the same thing here. I've seen a few things about World War I, World War II, and, and how the British kind of did their stuff. There was a great show on Netflix. It's still there, still available. Uh, it's like Churchill's New Recruits. And they were basically supposed to be like, OSS, okay, Oscar's ready to get down now. They were like OSS, and, and they took these folks uh, in modern day through what those agents would do if they were being recruited during World War II by Churchill, you know, under, under one of Churchill's um, uh, directives. Well, it was a really great show, and it was this kind of thing. It was, it was those cue moments that said, I got to have a testing lab like that. Well, that whole whatever workup was about getting that test lab down there where they could test out this machinery, but they have also all this other stuff in there. So that was the fun part of that. I really enjoyed doing it. But this, which was supposed to be a backstop, like you see in those, those movies and scenes and stories and stuff like that, this backstop uh, is actual real little bricks. You know, I bought these little bricks. I did not make these, which I typically make stuff. But I bought these and they went together beautifully. All I did was I stacked them and then I coated them with Mod Podge and they stuck together and they're not coming apart. I mean, these guys, they go together. The problem is they look too nice. They look too clean. And, and I thought, you know, if, if somebody's shooting, you know, uh, flames at this, a mixture of kerosene and, um, what was it kerosene and diesel was the mixture. Um, that thing's going to get a heck of a lot of abuse. It's not going to just stop it. So I didn't want to do just, you know, color, like, like burning color. I wanted to have some degradation of the brick. And so that's what I did. Um, so here, the very first thing I did, and I've got another shot to show you a little bit more, but I went over this really, really heavily with a dental tool. And this dental tool, I had to sharpen it a couple times because this stuff is really hard. Um, this is just a this kind of a dental tool. 
And this hook right here, um, boy, I'll tell you, that son of a gun, that got in there and it gave me the ability to carve these bricks. Um, so here's a better shot. And I think you can see a little bit better there how much I carved into just the center portion of that little brick wall. It deflects, I don't know, it's maybe an eighth of an inch. It's it's that much uh, that I, I took back. And then I and, and then I you know painted the the, the bricks in, in in different colors. You saw what they were before. Tried to damage them as much as possible, and then uh, I spray painted them. Now, when I'm spray painting these, it was a three step process. The first step was a gray ring around the outside. So you see that grayish tone on the outside of the black. That gray was the very first thing I did. I didn't fill everything in. I didn't just, you know, paint a big red or, or red. I didn't paint a big gray circle. I just did an outline because I knew I was going to put black in the center and I didn't want to cover up everything, right? Because it's, it's singeing, but it's, it, and, and, and it's blasting it, but you can still see the brick after it's unblasted. So um, I started with the gray on the outside. Then I did the black. Again, I did not go black. Well, I, actually, I did go black on everything in the center. And then I came in with the white. Now, um, I, I just love how it came out. But I have to uh, confess that not all of this is my doing. Um, after I painted this, I had, you, you see some of the, the white where it's like chipping off of the bricks. It's kind of like this, this singed whitish color. Um, on these bricks. Well, those, those uh, marks and stuff like that, I did not do. Those marks came from me shooting it with a clear coat, which, okay, it's great that I got the effect, but here's the problem with that. If I get the effect of something, but I can't repeat it, it's, it's almost worthless. It's fantastic that I got these colors. And, and I could repeat it now that they're there. But the white, the, the, the white, big, like squarish white, it's kind of hard to show. But that stuff was not my doing. I don't know what I did to get that. It happened. It just happened after I shot it with a clear coat. Which is very frustrating for a model builder. For, for you, I, I can imagine. Because... I don't know how to repeat it. Again, it gave me a great look and I could manually repeat it, but it would be great if I understood what happened so they could repeat it. So that's just one of the things, you know, one of the mysteries of bottle building, I guess. It's something I'm going to kind of come have to come back to and do because I have some more of these bricks. I really like the way they came out. I definitely want to use them again on something, but I want to know how to get that exact look. I did the gray, I did the black, I did the white, but the the white that's just on the individual bricks here, kind of splotchy, I did not do. Um, now, I've got some great comments here and, and Martin might have an, a good idea. Uh, so I need to get through these. I'm very sorry, uh, I, I have not been paying attention here, so. Uh, why did you, okay. I think, uh, Martin says, I think oversized works, especially in dark. We talked about that one. Great. Thank you very much. Martin says, Oh, that's why you're now explaining. Got it. Um, Hey Bill finally made it. Hey Mark. It's great to see you. Thank you very, very much. I saw some of your work this week. Very nice. Uh, Oh, you're going to miss next. You're going to miss next week too. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I love the scale rope. Anytime you see it, isn't that great? I love the scale rope that I have. Um, that is a rope and I've, and I've talked about it before and I've left links for it below before, but it's wonderful rope. It is from the, um, the shipbuilding industry. I got it from a ship building website. Um, and boy, I would tell you what it is. If I could remember where the heck it is, uh, I can't remember, but, um, I'll figure it out, but it's, yeah, it's great stuff. And, um, it doesn't fuzz. So the, the problem with scale rope, not the problem, but the solution that scale rope brings to this issue is it doesn't have the fuzz. If you're doing string or twine, lots of times it's going to have this fuzz. And 
And that doesn't look right. Now, maybe for hemp rope, okay, but it just, it doesn't look right in scale. This rope looks great in scale and it's properly made. The, the, the gentleman that I bought it from uh, in the website, um, it has a machine that you can buy to make your own rope if you want to. And, and it's like a rope walk, but for string. And yeah, it's brilliant. Anyway, so I will put that rope in sometime and, and you'll be able to see where I got it from. Uh, go for it painting is here. Hey, hello, go for it painting. Thanks very much for coming and by. Really nice to see you. Martin, do you also use solder wire for tubing sometimes? Um, I have in the past, I have used solder. The problem is solder, at least the solder I have, um, has still a little bit of spring back, but it also has resins uh, or rosin core or acid core the types of solder i have have those cores and over time the acid and the rosin both of them i've seen do on just my spools of uh, solder will start to corrode it'll start to interact with the air and 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 it'll grow little crystally stuff on it so i don't really want to use that if i paint it i don't know if that will you know still continue to corrode but i just don't like the fact that there's a there's a chemical in there an acid or a, or a rosin that will possibly change over time and do something to my diorama. You know, when you build your diorama, think of it, well, I think of it, think of it living for an awful long time. You know, um, what's going to happen in a year, five years, 10 years. If you make something and hand it down to your kids or your grandkids or something like that, what, what's it going to do then? It's really neat to go back and look at old dioramas, right? It, it really is. But sometimes you notice the material they use didn't hold up or this or that. So that's why I like using the lead. I don't believe there's anything that comes off the lead. I coat the lead so that you, you know, you're not getting, getting anything from it by touching it or something like that. Uh, no paint chips, you know. Um, but yeah, that's why I, I've, I've kind of moved away from doing that. Because I had tried it in the past, many years ago, and it just didn't quite work for me. And then when I found the lead, brilliant. Be careful with it. You know, don't get it in your mouth. You know, don't like have a piece and, oh, I'm just going to hold on. You know, that's not going to work. Um, it's not good stuff. Uh, it's lead. So be awfully careful with it. But um, it does great. And, and the non-spring back, for me, when you're trying to route it through, you know, like an engine compartment or something like that, and, and things are in there and they're tiny and they're delicate, you don't want to move something that it spring back and you can knock off parts and stuff like that. This stuff, you can fold it, you can move it around, you can you can work its way along an engine block, along an engine block, and it'll stay there. So yeah, great stuff. I, I would I would definitely recommend the lead, but use the proper cautions, please. Um, thanks very much, Martin. Uh, Martin says, is that track HO size? It's either no, it's not HO. It's, I believe it's N scale. It's O scale or N, I think it's N scale. My hair, I'm sorry. I, I weird out about my hair all the time because I can see myself and it's weird. Anyway, um, yeah, it's N scale. And uh, I really like it. Erdink, hello, hello, how are you? You know, I saw a really cool ad uh, or just a picture of Erdink uh, this week. And uh, he has a barbershop. And um, Erdink, if you want to say where your barbershop is, uh, it's really super nice. High, high end stuff. It's in the UK. Um, that would be great. You can post it. I would love for you to post so people could maybe visit if they're near you. I think that'd be cool. I want to come there someday if I ever get out to the UK. Um, John says, was it because the clear coat pooled in those areas and made those marks? You know, I don't know. I it just, you know, somebody had silvering. I think Martin asked if silvering, it could have been silvering. It, you know, I don't, everything was dry. I'll, I'll put it that way. Everything was dry. But when, when I like uh, scraped off the, the surface of this, so I'm going to take this out of here. This one's not actually mounted in yet. So here's the back of it. So I haven't really done much to the back of it. And when I, I have this, that's got Mod Podge on it. So it's like sealed, right? Well, when I started working on this side, you know, to get the, 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 worn look and things like that that I got out of it that opened up those bricks right it made them porous again I, I took that skin 
I took that Mod Podge seal off of it and it made it porous. So it's quite possible both John and Martin have had made, you know, uh, uh, remarks to this. Uh, could be some sort of silvering with tr air trapped in it. That could certainly be it, you know. Um, maybe it was heavier. Um, maybe as it's drying, it's pulling air out. I don't know. But that's a very good thing. I noticed that in the areas that I did have Mod Podge and I, and I hadn't chipped stuff away, it's less like out here on the edges. But all this center in here, I got those beautiful white marks. And again, I'm not complaining. I'm just a little upset that I don't know how to repeat it. And, and I think repeatability is something that, that we're all kind of looking for in this, because if I do something once really cool, I want to do it again, or I want to know what I did last time. So if I want to do it different, I don't repeat a mistake, right? So repeatability and understanding your process is huge. And, and, and I just, I don't know on this one yet, but darn it, we'll get there. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da, and we talked about Martin. Uh, John, yes, that also makes sense. Air trapped in the brick. Yeah, very good, John. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think I think that's that might be it. I don't know because of the irregular surface of the bricks. Maybe, maybe. Um, it did it both on the carved brick and the flat bricks that I didn't do anything to. So it's very odd. Uh, it was TS TS eighty. It was uh, to me a TS eighty. Mark, oh joy! I used some of the 015 resin core solder for wiring on a model. Oh no! Yeah. See, that's the thing is I don't know what that resin's going to do or rosin. Sorry. Um, I'm just not sure. I have some, as I said, and if you look on the, on the spool, it, 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 there's like a little bit of crystal and at the, at the very end, maybe painting it is going to keep air out of there. And, and air is what oxidation is about having air contacting it and, 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 and the chemical reaction between the air and the, and whatever the element is. So maybe painting, it's going to help uh, on that mark. Um, but I would love to find out, you know, uh, how long was it? Let's take a look at it. You know, that would be kind of nice to know if it did. I never had it happen on my models. I didn't want it to happen. So that's why I switched. So there you go. Uh, don't worry about your hair, Bill. I wish I had that problem. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'm sure someday it'll all be gone. Um, but it's just weird. I don't know. Um, Scott says I'm with Martin. I wish I had a problem too. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. I just, yeah, I'm a, I'm a 59 year old man. Why am I worried about my hair? I don't know. It's just weird. I've never had long hair. Number one, I always had short hair until three years ago. So it's kind of, it's just kind of fun. Uh, Oh, hey, thank you very much, Go For It Painting. You know what? This is something, folks, that I'm just a complete meh about. I never tell people, well, I rarely tell people to subscribe or hit the like. Please do. Um, I really love doing this. Every week, I'm I'm putting this out on Fridays, and it is kind of a uh, uh, an uphill battle <laughs> trying to get everything together and make sure I take the right shots. And, and a lot of times, I don't. And but it's really fun and I want to continue. Well, I'm going to continue doing it, but I would love for you to be a part of it and see it when they come out and, and, and by you subscribing and stuff, more people will see it and, and then, you know, all that. So yes, please. And thank you very much for, for mentioning that. Uh, um, go for it painting. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Erding says, I would love to have you in here, sir. Anytime I will massage you something, uh, message you something just comes on the Facebook market and pretty good price. Let me know what you think, please. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that would be really fun, Erding, to, to, to visit your studio because it's great. And I do want to promote your studio because there's a lot of folks that are from the UK on, on my live streams and see my stuff. And, and I love promoting other stuff, other folks things. It doesn't necessarily have to be model building because, you know, this is your business and allows you to model build. So I would love to promote anybody's stuff. Uh, I think it'd be wonderful and, and especially friends. So thanks very much, Erdink. Uh, Paul says, I hit the like when I first come in, Bill. Thank you very much, Paul. That's really nice. And, and thank you for remembering because I don't remember. Um, I'm supposed to talk about Patreon. I always forget that too. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, HMS Victory Ship, pretty big. Oh, pretty big. Yeah, I, I think that would be pretty cool. I had somebody talking to me the other day about... Um, they were talking about doing a uh, battleship, a big ship, but in small, and then using uh, fiber optic for lighting the portholes. 
which I think is a great idea. I love the, the, the look of a ship lit at night, you know, properly lit and, and everything like that's just a really neat scene. I always thought that was cool. Um, okay. Uh, Martin, thank you very much, Martin. I appreciate it. So let's see what the heck I got left here. I, I don't know that there's all that much really. Um, I, I kind of think I hit most of the stuff I was going to talk about today, but I did want to show you some pictures. So here are some nicer pictures of what I did this week to try to see, because it's at that point, you know, where I'm kind of getting everything in here. I've got a lot of things secured. I've got a lot of things that have been, you know, uh, uh, glued down and stuff like that. But like this hasn't been, uh, this is the fuel cell. That's how it's going to look inside there. Um, I've not put in, well, there's a couple of things that haven't been glued down, but the next part is figuring out how to dirty this up. I don't know if I'm going to start in on that yet, because when I, when I start in on that, I, I kind of want to do everything. And I've only done two rooms yet. You know, we've got a lot more things to do. I thought it was funny this morning. I, I set out a, a, a little email or a little short or a reel or something like that. And I said, almost done, but, but there's a whole bunch to go. Well, it's almost done with this component is, is what it is. Uh, but there's a whole other rest of the diorama to do. So there's a whole lot left on this thing, but I'm almost done with this room. This is that shelf. And I'm really happy with the shelf. I love the shelf because it just shows a bunch of dissimilar parts that they're using to try to fabricate. Now, this is a little different. I want to show you, I love the, the look down long hallways, um, but these are not seen except from this angle. And you can't see this angle once they're in the diorama. So what I think I'm going to do is just other angles. What I think I'm going to do is I am going to take this and I'm probably going to remove these boards. Um, I was just going to have it so that, you know, you just saw this part. And if you kind of look at an angle, well, you can see back in there and it's all fine. But I, I kind of like that stuff back there. And now I do want to show it. So in the diorama, how that's going to affect the diorama is this is where this goes. This goes in just like this. Okay, that's where it's going to go. And what I've got here is a little wedge, a little block that shows where that kind of goes in because this is set back a little bit in the diorama. See, it's kind of set back about a finger, well, not a finger length, but a half a finger length or something like that. So I believe what I've got to do is I might just remove this area and then open this up. And then you're going to be able to see more of the tunnel. I like the idea that a tunnel goes into an area and you can't see anything unless you're looking down the tunnel. I like that idea because that gives you the ability to light it. And if you're lighting something, if you don't have shadow, it's not as effective. You want to, you want to light it so you can get the shadows. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm working on that and I'm, and I'm trying to figure out how that's going to work out, but I'm really happy with it. So kind of reviewing this, we've got this part, just about done. This is the testing lab. Okay. The next part that I'm working on, and, and I was working on it last time too, but now I'm painting and detailing stuff is Captain Livens, his room. That's this, right? So just like that, I'm going to put everything in here once it's all getting painted. And then those two rooms um, will be pretty much done. And then as you saw, I'm moving to this corner piece, which is going to have our rail car and, um, and it's not a car. It's just like a flatbed. And what it is, is when the folks are here digging, cause this goes right here. When they're digging the new tunnel, they need to be able to transport the dirt, the sand, the muck, whatever mud, uh, they throw it into sandbags and then they put it on that cart and then they can wheel that out. And then that goes around this corner. That's why I've got a turntable and then it goes to here and then they can lift it to the surface and then they utilize those sandbags to reinforce their position. Um, so that's how that's going to go. And that's going to be next. So I'm going to kind of finish that off. Now, one problem that I'm having, and this, this went back to my failed attempt to paint something like it's right color and then move to weathering instead of just going with a base coat and trying to get the color out of the oil. That's what I tried to do. Uh, if I said that properly, well, I did that with this 
and it did not go over well. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. Uh, Martin has a quick question and then we'll look at that because I'm going to show you the top down so you can get a really, really nice tight picture of that. Are you going to cover the outside of the black sprayed foam with veneer? Maybe you should see, uh, uh, maybe you said this in an earlier episode. I can't remember right now. Yes, I will. I certainly will. Um, that's something that I like to do. I've got all of my dioramas now when I build them. I just like this process. It, it the, the foam is perfect because it, it, it supports everything in the diorama, but it doesn't look all that great. And it's certainly really easy to work with, but it don't look all that great. So what I will do is I will have a facade over this and that facade will do a couple of things. Number one, it'll make it all nice and clean and pretty and proper, blah, blah, blah. But it also gives me a, uh, the ability to mount signage or, or some kind of placard that, that gives a little description of as to what's going on. Maybe it's a little historical fact. Maybe it's uh, a fantasy, whatever, you know, but I want to give information about it. And I think it'll be kind of interdispersed like I've done before, where I've got a little bit of a story, a little bit of a fantastic story going on, but then I'll sprinkle in the true stuff. Captain Livens was a real person. Um, the Livens uh, uh, large gallery flame projector was a real thing. Um, you know, the, the Anzacs, cause I'm going to have Anzacs, the, um, Australian and New Zealand uh, miners that, that did some of this work. That's who's going to be highlighted for digging all of the underground. Captain Livens is working there, but the Anzacs are the ones that made the, the tunnels and, and, and all the structure. So I'm going to be highlighting the Anzacs. So there's going to be some stories about them. Um, I like to put that information in there for, for a few reasons. Number one, it's nice to give people something to kind of reference, you know, you've, you've made this image, you've made this diorama, whatever the fact, but if they don't recognize, they don't know it, you know, you got to give them something. I used to not think I wanted to write it down. They had to figure it out, but now I'm getting into these concepts that are a little bit more obscure that I want to tell folks what this is. I think this part of history is fascinating. The fact that, you know, Captain Libbins built this massive flamethrower, this 56 foot long you know, monstrosity that, you know, here we, we, you know, hold on. I've got pictures and I'll show you because you got to see this thing again. Um, it, cause it's just a monster. So I've got some pictures of the Livens, the, the drawing that I referenced. I'm sorry. I'm just ripping through. Here it is. So here is the Livens large gallery flame projector. So my point is when you're introducing something like this to folks that maybe aren't aware of it, cause I didn't know about this. Well, it's like five years ago. I, I heard about it. Um, you want to give as much information, I think, as possible because you don't want to say, well, that's just silly. That's not right. When in fact, it's absolutely correct. This is something that they did in World War II. Or I'm sorry, World War I. And it was necessary because they were trying to end the war. It had been going on for, at that time, this was in, two, this was in 1916. Um, so it had been going on for four years. And no, not four years, two years. Um, and so, you know, these, these folks are just like, look, we've got to get this thing done. We've got to get it ended. And so they're coming up with these bigger and more terrible and more horrendous, uh, you know, machines of war to try to do it. Um, you know, what the, what the mind thinks of in trying to solve these very complex and very emotional problems, you know, this is an extremely emotional thing when you're, when you're developing a weapon, I've got a, I've got a place in here and. And I thought, you know, maybe I overthink this stuff, but this is, you know, Captain Livens, his lab, okay? And in his lab, what I'm saying he's doing is he's conceiving and thinking of this, you know, this weapon of war, uh, the flamethrower. But he's also considering the magnitude of what he's doing, you know? He's, he's considering what this thing is going to do, and he has to. Because the lethality, the lethality of it has to be calculated. You have to know that all of the expense you're going through, all of the effort, all the danger, you know, to, to get this thing in place, is it worth it? So you have to calculate the lethality, the lethality of it. And so that's what I have going on up here. There are books. It's almost a study. And like on his desk, he's got maps. He's not just a scientist, he's a military officer. And so he's very aware 
of what impact this um, this dramatic weapon can can have. And I think that's a, a, a very um, it's a very deep thought, you know, and, and, and I think it's worth thinking about. Um, in here, like I was saying, with that desk, it's going to be right here. And, and if you see right here, there's a there's a railing that goes here. And then on the opposite side, there is a massive chalkboard. And, and we've had conversations about how that massive chalkboard got down there. But the point is, um, I imagine him two, three o'clock in the morning, you know, uh, maybe the pounding is stopped. You know, the artillery is stopped. It's quiet, but he's still working on trying to get this thing done. Well, I just see him. I can physically see him standing there, leaning on that thing, looking at his calculations on that chalkboard. And I think that's really, you know, there's, there's something to that. I think that we have to kind of try and put some of those things in the diorama to make it not just that was neat. I want people to look at it and I want them to think about what I've put in there. Um, sometimes it's serious, sometimes it's fun, but I really want to give them enough that when people look at this, they can maybe do a little bit of reading. They can look at the imagery. They can see how it's all configured. But I want them to think about it. I want them to think, like what we're talking about. What's How lethal is this thing? Was it necessary? How effective was it after it was deployed? You know, this thing was deployed four times in 1916 um, against the German lines. Um, what was the effect? What was the impact? Um, why was it never seen again? Uh, you know, was, was this something that came under the Geneva uh, um, uh, Accords? I, I, I'm thinking Marvel. It's not Accords, but the Geneva um, treaties that said you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't have chemical warfare, you can't, you know, these things. Um, they had to be considered. Well, am I putting enough information in this diorama for you to think about it too? That's what I want to do. I want this thing to go away and say, wow, nice diorama. Okay. But the concepts conceived in it are real. They happened in World War I a uh, hundred years ago. Um, is this something that we should be thinking about now? Is it a lesson that we should learn from it? Anyway, I don't want to get too deep, but I think of these things when I'm modeling it and, and, and when I'm trying to come up with things to tell a little bit of that story, to, to, to kind of get you into that mode. And um, I think it's interesting. I hope you think it's interesting. I mean, that's why I do it. Um, I mean, I do it because I, I want to satisfy that to tell that story, but I'm also hoping that people are interested in, in reading and looking at that story and then taking something away from it. So thanks you very much. Um, Geneva convention. Thank you, Paul. I, pff, you know, I used to be able to think of stuff really, really well. You know, I was pretty quick. Yeah, forget about it. I'm 59. I'm old. So <laughs> it's good. I got more cobwebs uh, in my head than, than anywhere else. Uh, so we talked about Martins. And thank you very much, Paul, Geneva Convention. Um, and yeah, so uh, I think that those things are important to think about when you're designing your diorama. I think they're important to consider. And I think that it makes it a very enjoyable thing because... When I'm doing this, I'm learning uh, constantly. Uh, I'm researching and I'm reading and I'm looking at videos and I'm looking at what other people have done and, and, and their comments and, and what interpretations they've had from these things. And I think that makes it for a much better and interesting diorama. So hopefully some of that stuff was interesting to you today. And hopefully you can take something from it and, and maybe put in your own diorama. Um, I will go back and say now, I, I please wish you would look at um, saying uh, uh, you like the video, you know, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, maybe you haven't, uh, that would be great if you do. Um, I do these every Friday. I do have a Patreon. The Patreon is kind of fun. Some of my patrons are here. Uh, the Patreon's kind of fun because on my patrons uh, page, uh, what I do, and I'm going to see if I can get over here and show you my slide. There it is. Uh, so here are my patrons. I also have Discord, and we have pretty good conversations on there. Um, I don't have so many patrons right now, but I'm hoping to gather more. But I really love the patrons I have because what they're doing is they're helping to support what I do, and they're allowing me to get these things out. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, this is just the balsa wood solution. I, I have this up just in case anybody is interested in it. 
Um, that's one of the things that I've had a lot of comments on. So I've just kept it in my slides ever since. But thank you very much, everybody. I think we're about done. If there's any other questions, I would absolutely love to hear them. I'd love to answer them. Um, this evening, uh, I'm going to have our weekly group build. Um, and that is for the top tier patrons. Um, and I'm hoping, uh, well, there's Evan, I haven't seen Evan last week, but John and I were in there and Daniel. So the top three of my uh, patrons are in there on Fridays and it's a really nice build. You know, we, we just get together and we just kind of do this. Um, but you get to talk and not just me yammering on, um, for three hours, it's from six to 9 PM. Um, I'm not going to do a demo tomorrow, but last week on Saturday and the prior week on Saturday, I did two live demos. They're very short. They're very quick. But if you want to go back to the channel, some of the things that I've talked about, I did some quick demos and I think they came out pretty good. Uh, one was on the wiring for the led light. And the other one was, I have no idea, but it was prior to that. And so it was pretty good. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. It looks like it's going to be kind of a nice weekend around here. And uh, if you had uh, in, if you were in the U.S. last weekend and you did Labor Day, this is now the time where you can actually rest. It's actually a weekend where you can actually sleep because all that vacationing last weekend, nobody got any sleep. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I just want to make sure I got everybody here. Uh, Scott McLeod says, thanks, Bill, for what you do for us. Thank you very much, Scott. And you guys give me a lot. You know, all through the week, I hear from Scott. I hear from a lot of people. I, I, I hear from Evan. I hear um, from all these guys, Earl. And it's great because you, you see the stuff that I post because I do a post every day. I, I, I post a short virtually every day now uh, at 10 a.m. And it's just an update on the build. And it's really fun to hear your comments and and uh, certainly ideas. I've definitely had lots of ideas from folks here. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mark Doremus, well, it's not in here, Mark, but there was one that Mark gave me on the last diorama that was really, really cool. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. And once again, cheers from Holland. Thank you very much, Martin. And I'm looking forward to more shots because you got your nice backdrop now. That'd be very cool. Mark, thanks, Bill. See you in a couple of weeks or maybe in a couple of model meetings. I am going to go to the IPMS meeting tomorrow. So there's an IPMS meeting, uh, the Seattle IPMS group in, uh, in Bellevue tomorrow. So I will be there. And I'm going to bring this, if I can get it all buttoned up. Um, and John uh, Robeck says, thanks, Bill. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. John comes in and, and, and we have great conversations. And sometimes it's just us on that group build. Uh, most of the time, it's just us on that group build. And it's a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy working with uh, John. And, and, you know, the neat thing about this is you make friends online. And I don't know. I, I don't make any distinction. You know, you never met them or not, but you're online and you're seeing each other. And you're talking. I they're my friends. So yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. So thank you very much, John. And uh, really appreciate you uh, being there tonight. So thanks, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful Friday. Uh, it's a wonderful weekend coming up around here. I hope it's cooler in your area if you're in the southern and eastern parts of the United States. It, you know, in Europe, I've seen some really crazy weather. I hope it's getting a little bit better there too, folks. Um, we got winter coming on. Hopefully it's evening some things out for you. And um, boy, I hope you have a great weekend. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful one, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. See ya.